I have spent time describing their antics in my first 10 or so predominantly non-medical chapters. The Pembroke Mental Health Center doesn't have doctors except on special occasions. I think it is mainly women who gossip with crazies and drunks. So this lawyer who was helping out of Goodwill said I was very wrong to think the UKBA did not believe my story of no contact with the Pembroke. The UKBA did believe the allegation that I never consorted with the Pembroke Mental Health Center. The UK was deporting me because I did not consort with the Pembroke Mental Health Center. He said as a defense against deportation, I should hook up with some mental health center. I can't remember who my doctor was at the end of 2017. Whoever it was, they wouldn't allow me to hook up with another mental health center. It had to be the Pembroke or nobody else, he said. I was almost appeals exhausted by the UKBA. At the start of 2018, I moved to Liverpool and requested UBKA to let me report at a local reporting center. The transfer of reporting centers after eight years of reporting at Eaton House took a few months and did not materialize. Owing to my departure voluntarily from the United Kingdom, I was waiting in Liverpool to do something called further submissions. I have to go to a court here. But in legal terms it was not a court and I don't know the correct word to describe it. Well, I continued to have cardiac episodes so I had medicals in Liverpool. And new words appeared on my ECG. Liverpool is different from London and it wasn't as easy to get medical records. Initially, I registered with the GP close to the cheap, crowded hostel where I was staying. It was a cheerful place with foreign youth and US long-stay tourists. My first appointment in the GP surgery, there was a Chinese GP. I had these long-term and unexplained flu-like symptoms, and I asked him if I could have my recent medical record. I used to try very hard to get my medical records. In London, they didn't mind. The GP said I was crazy and someone like me did not need to have medical records. He also pressed a bell on his desk, I mean I think it was an electrical bell that would ring another room. A lady colleague of his rushed into the room. I felt he had a prior agreement with her to come whenever he pressed that calling bell. The two of them asked a few questions, which would test whether I am completely crazy. After the questions she let me go. My guesswork would be that the Chinese GP checked on the national computer and based on what is written, there said that I must be crazy and crazy people don't need to access their medical records. He was seeing me for the first time and did not know me personally. He must have got the crazy stuff from the computer. I don't know what was exactly written in the NHS computer. I felt he had had a colleague attend to section me if the need be. Being two doctors, if they decided I was crazy, they could section me right away. I mean that's the law. You need two doctors to say I do, before you can lock someone up. Luckily the lady, who was the primary asker, did not think so. They did not abuse their power in this case, falsely sectioning me. I have not been falsely sectioned. Then I was having this flu and cough and just infection and once I had an ambulance take me away from a place of staying. On another occasion, I took a taxi to Liverpool Hospital. My lung x-ray came out so bad that they wanted to do a second one again in half an hour to see if the bad shapes on the x-ray were not caused by metallic objects I was wearing. They told me I had some contagious disease and after a couple of hours a day, asked me to go home with antibiotics. The second time at accident and emergency, they told me my heartbeat was 140, and I had unstable angina, and it wasn't safe to go home. It was a Thursday or Friday, and they admitted me into a cardiology ward. I said it was scary there. Everybody else appeared to me to be over 90 years of age, nobody could walk or speak, and they never woke up in a 24-hour cycle. Every body function was carried out, through its tube. You could hear the peaceful roaring and snoring sounds. Perhaps not conducive to a good night's sleep for younger people. I suppose such persons are called cabbages, but they were not sick or suffering. I am sure they were survivors. I could sense well-being coming from those cabbages. The nurse said not to be afraid since had three cardiology wards here. One ward was for people they expected would die. This ward where I had been put was for people who were expected to survive. I stayed there till Monday in that ward. The consultant a cardiologist arrived. He told me I am completely normal and there is nothing wrong with my heart. One can ask how come the accident and emergency doctors thought I had unstable angina, but the consultant found me completely normal. The consultant asked me to go home. He had medication for a week for me to pick up. After a week, I could ask my GP if he wanted them to continue, he said. 
It was seven or eight different tablets to take daily. The cocktail included bisoprolol, atorvastatin, and sorbitrate. At this time, I had not been given bisoprolol before. I was not given bisoprolol during my UK stay, only for a week in Liverpool, shortly before I left, and sorbitrate. My maternal grandma was on five sorbitrates at the time of her death from congestive heart failure in 1991. Also, bisoprolol is a beta blocker. It is used for the treatment of heart failure but I had not picked up my medicines and did not know what the contents of my cocktail were for the coming week. I asked the consultant why if I am normal, was he giving medication? The consultant replied, oh it's to help you, and if you don't want to take them. I was so tired I could barely walk. Naturally, I think it's okay to send me home, but not okay to tell me, I'm completely normal. I did take the one week's medication and took it at home and I couldn't contact the GP. The woman thing came up again, but a woman doctor. She was a consultant for infectious diseases. I had to go back and see her. After completing my course of antibiotics, she showed me my lung x-ray asking, can you see all the stuff showing up on your x-ray? I said sorry, all I see are gray patches. They mean nothing to me. She said I was delusional, because how the heck could I think I could interpret an x-ray? But that was precisely what I had said. Like my London doctor, she refused me painkillers. I feel some drugs are completely unnecessary and probably far more dangerous than painkillers. I don't know for sure, since I'm not a doctor. Painkillers are there for pain and when I have a lot of pain, why not have some relief? She wanted me to just take paracetamol. She said they had this new thing where women work as painkillers. I can't remember the exact words she used. When you are in a lot of pain, they won't give you any painkillers. Not even paracetamol. They'll put a woman in your room as support to be there while you howl in pain. I forgot to mention in the earlier chapters when I was talking about being hounded by the Metropolitan Police. Then I was talking about Pembroke men kicking and banging the door. I forgot to mention in that part of my documentary that this profession for a woman is where her job is to ride police cars. When police visit somebody's home, it could be to make an arrest. They may just be visiting a trouble spot. The visited person might be the victim or whatever. This is the type of lady that rides police cars and goes in with the police to talk to the victim or culprit or whatever. She is a comfort pillow to the human race. Having a woman in the room is so comforting to a person being arrested by the police or to a victim who is being visited by the police or to someone howling with pain. In all such instances, the presence of a woman in the room generates immense comfort. Her profession is in the same group as paid and passive listeners. All of them provide emotional comfort to people in unfortunate circumstances, preferably their own sex. The job may involve sitting back and listening, which has a parallel in the oldest profession in the world, where you lie back and take it. Also, you must remember that Pembroke men kicked and banned the door for years when my boyfriend went to work to try and start a conversation with me in case I accidentally stepped out of the house. Their motive was to hook me up with Pembroke women. To force me to receive women-to-woman -woman support and mental intimacy supplied commercially by the health service of differently abled girls hailing from socially and educationally backward communities of various countries. Finally, this female specialist at Liverpool told me about women working as painkillers. I had already heard of this in London on television. A new scheme where women act as painkillers. In this job, they provided woman support to someone with pain. If only you, dear God could allow these pain-killing support professionals could have a bit of pain themselves. Dot am I being unkind? That is what I asked God. And that's what I'm asking you now.